Oh, um, okay. I was pretty discombobulated during my Kant lecture. Hopefully this one will go better. <laughs> the combination of a discombobulating day and, and really difficult material, but assume stuff is not as bad. So, okay. So I ended up, I ended uh, last time kind of like really quickly going through the argument for skepticism about matters of fact. So I'm going to um, go back over it still pretty quickly, but not quite as quickly. <laughs> um, uh, still pretty quickly because I want to leave time for uh, the new stuff. But um, so I said this argument has four steps, right? So the first step is that... Um, Our reasons for belief in matters of fact. And I guess I should say, so I'm going to call these remote matters of fact. By remote, I mean right, that is other than uh, the immediate object of sense and memory. Because remember, he's this skepticism doesn't have anything to do with the things I'm sensing now or even the things I remember. It's only the things that I'm that are beyond the evidence of present sense and memory. Um, so that these reasons, this reason, a reason maybe I should say, is. always an inference from effect to cause. Now, I mean, I think if you look at it in this more detail, what he means is that it's an inference from an effect to a cause, and then back to a collateral effect. Um, so like, for example, um, I see fire. I mean, it's confusing. Both Hume and Barclay, maybe also Locke, tend to do this. They'll call the visible fire the fire. And they'll say, like, you know, I infer from the fire that 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 I'm going to feel heat or something like that. But of course, that just means I infer from the visible fire that the that the tangible fire is also there. That is this 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 effect. Um, the the sensible uh, properties are the effect of the fire on me. And from this effect, I infer that a certain cause is there, namely fire. And then, because I infer that that cause is there, I infer that it will have all its other usual effects, for example, heat. Right, so, like, similarly, when I see something that has all the uh, usual appearance of bread, I infer that it will, that if I eat it, it will um, be nutritious. Um, I mean, again, you can, you could describe that as concluding as in like, um, and then it sounds like an inference from cause to effect, right? You can describe that by saying, um, 
like I infer from from the fact that this is bread that it will that it will be nutritious because bread has always been nutritious in the past or something like that. But I think when Hume describes it more carefully, he says that right. The question is basically whether it is bread. Or that is whether it's something that has all the effects of bread or something that only has some of the effects of bread. Um, so what I'm inferring from the effect, that is the, the, the effect it has of looking to me like bread, I'm inferring that it really is bread and therefore will have all its collateral effects. Um. And that's that's a remote matter of fact. Why? Because like all future facts are matters of fact are remote. Right? It's only sense and memory. Um so that's why like what you might think of as the usual problem of induction and as like and Hume sometimes puts it this way, how do we know the future will be like the past? Right. Um, is like a, a subclass of this problem because it's because all those future matters of fact are remote and we're trying to infer what they'll be like from the present effect of something on my senses. I know what's here now, namely something that looks like fire. Not doubting that. Something that looks like fire is here now. But uh, um, but I'm wondering is, how do I know that that thing also is going to feel like fire? This, by the way, I think I never got a, a chance to discuss this when we talked about Barclay, like how good Barclay's response to skepticism actually is. Um, um, so Barclay says, since the fire is just an idea in me, there's no room to doubt that it's really there. Right, the fire. It the fire is the thing that's immediately present to my mind. So the skeptic has no way to get in there and raise a doubt. But the truth is that for Barclay also, right? If like you, if you remember that the those, the ideas of light and heat that we put together to make up our idea of fire. Um, can occur by themselves. And in fact, they do occur by themselves when we see the fire, but we're not close enough to feel it. So um, so when we, what we mean when we say that the thing fire is there is not just that I have this idea of light, which true, we can't doubt that, what I mean is, and like Locke also agrees, you can't doubt, like at least if you if you have a simple idea, right? Like if if you perceive white, then there must be something white that is something that can cause you to perceive white. <laughs> um, so, um, but the question is, will the other simple ideas that make up our complex idea of fire also come? That's what the skeptic is really doubting when they doubt whether it's really fire. Um, and Barclay's only answer to that is um, the same as Descartes' answer to skepticism, namely that God is not a deceiver. Right? That since those things, we've come to rely on those things going together, God won't let us down, basically. Or if he does, he'll have a good reason. <laughs> and it will be good for us to have been deceived. So, like, it's, it's, you like, it's not, um, he doesn't really have a better answer to skepticism than Descartes does. That was all about Barclay. 
All right. So like put that all in parentheses, but we are talking about this. We're in the same neighborhood in Hume. Of course, God isn't going to come in here. Right. So, um, and Hume would say that bringing God in is not going to help here. So again, like the, the way we know that the future will be like the, or the reason we believe that the future will be like the past is because we can infer from an effect to a cause and then back to another effect. And that's also the reason we believe that the past that we don't remember was like the past that we do remember. Right? So in that case, like, you know, if, like, if we come to a forest or that would used to be a forest, but we see like a whole bunch of burnt stumps and whatever, right? So we infer from the effect that the cause was there in the past and the, the, that the cause of that burning was there in the past. And uh, we think that that cause had all its collateral effects just as it has in cases that we've observed right so we infer that there was heat and light in the past even though we weren't there so we don't remember it right and similarly like it's also why we believe that matters of fact that are uh um that are present but are outside our current um evidence of our senses are like the past and present that we do have experience of, right? So like if we smell smoke, we infer that the usual cause of smoke is there. Mm -hmm. And therefore we infer that there's light and heat, even though it maybe is too far away for us to see it or behind a wall or whatever. Um, well, I spent longer on that than I should have, but it's important to understand. So it's always an inference from effect to cause. And the and the effect ultimately is always the effect of the object on my sense. Some object is now having on my senses. It, like in those cases I gave, it's pretty, it's relatively simple the way it works. Although, like in the burnt forest case, it's already kind of indirect, right? Like the immediate effect is like that the burnt forest has on me is seeing black stumps and whatever, right? But then I infer from that that there was a cause that that made it that that made it do that to me now, and that that cause is the same as the kind of causes I know that make other things do that. Um, and so I infer to the the fire that's not there now, but I infer that it was there, right? And, you know, like the longest train of inferences about history or whatever is, is still supposed to be like that. There's always a present effect on my senses. And then from that, I infer back to cause, to cause, to cause, to cause, to what I'm interested in, right? So like I'm in a desert island that is a deserted island, and I see the remains of pompous buildings. And Hume says, "I right, I I conclude that the place was once inhabited by civilized people." Um, it's that's that's just like the fire, inferring that the fire was there from seeing the burnt forest. All right, so. Um, So that's step number one. <laughs> step number two is this presupposes a connection. So actually what Hume says, this is on page 16, here it is constantly presupposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which is inferred from it. Should I, I don't have a very good place to put the document camera right now, but it's here. Yeah. 
And I always wonder whether using the document camera is a waste of time, but I've asked students before if they found it helpful and they usually said yes, so I don't know. There's the pompous buildings, right? But anyway, and here it is constantly supposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which is inferred from it. Were there nothing to bind them together, the inference would be entirely precarious. Right, so uh, like in order to infer from the light that I see to the existence of a certain kind of thing, fire, I have to assume there's some connection between me seeing light and there being a fire. Um, um, so they, I mean, the connection roughly means that a connection right so the roughly speaking the connection means that i assume that there's a necessary relationship between them of some kind right that that there couldn't be light unless there was fire i mean of course i may realize that that there could be light if there wasn't fire if something else were different or whatever but it's i mean it's so it might be more complicated but it's basically something like that like there couldn't be light now if there weren't fire so there must be fire Right. Again, otherwise, as he says, the inference would be entirely precarious. Um, uh, see, I'm not sure exactly what he means by precarious. Precarious didn't used to mean exactly what it means now. Maybe it means like chancy or something like that risky contingent i'm not sure okay anyway that doesn't really matter <laughs> um uh, obviously the inference isn't much good if there's no necessary relation between the two things so how do we know that there's a connection um We learn about such connections from experience. Now, I mean, this is a little bit tricky if you think back to the fire example or the bread example, I mean, uh, what we actually learned from experience is that the two effects go together. Um, Right, as like as Locke says, knowledge of substances is about the necessary coexistence of properties. Um, we learn that the thing that 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 uh, that when the the thing that causes light also always causes heat. Um, but. Um, so we learn the connection between that there is between the cause and the effect, but only um, that cause is always denominated by some effect, 
right? So in other words, we learn that the cause that that there won't be light unless the cause of heat is there. Um, and we learn that from experience, right? Hume says, um, and for, like this is where the disagreement with Locke is going to come in, right? Hume says, just by having an idea, for example, the idea of light, if I never had it before, I couldn't know anything about uh, the cause of what other effects has to be present. Of course, I do know that the cause of light has to be present. <laughs> um, that again is the present evidence of the senses that, that Hume isn't trying to doubt here. Right. So uh, when I have the idea of light, I know that the, the cause of light must be present. But the but the question is, like, do I know what the cause of light is? And the way of knowing what it is is knowing what other effects it could cause. So do I know that the thing that causes heat is present just because I experience light? And Hume says, no, never. Um, whereas Locke says, yes, sometimes, not in that case, but in the case where I feel that I, where I have the idea of solidity, I do know the cause of what other effects is there, right? I know the cause of the effect that I won't be able to bring my hands together unless it moves out of the way is there. That's the visible necessary connection. Um, and that's the, that's the crucial thing that according to Locke allows us in a very restricted way to know something beyond the evidence of present sense and experience. For example, to know something about future matters of fact, right? I know that what won't happen is that my hands will come together and yet the thing will still be there. <laughs> um, um, whereas Hume says, no, just from having that sensation of solidity, how could I know that? Right? So, I mean, this is the important doctrine that's, that's, uh, um, famously Hume's view of it. I think we saw that, that Barclay already maintains this, right? That, there, there can't be a necessary connection between distinct ideas. Why not? I mean, I think I'm going to talk about that if I get to it later when I talk about the idea of power. But it's, I mean, but it's basically, right? It's basically for the same reason Barclay has. Ideas are inert. Um, and how do we know that? I mean, again, I think it's basically the same reason as in Berkeley, although Hume doesn't say this very explicitly, but it's because an idea is something that um, um, happens to me, but I could only represent uh, power by doing something, not by having something happen to me. So that's what allows, that's what leads Barclay to conclude that we don't have an idea of um, power or necessity, but we do represent it because we are power or necessity. So like, we'll have to see why, why Hume thinks that that doesn't work either. But okay, so anyway, so 
that's I think that's how we can be sure that we can only learn about connections from experience. The idea itself will never reveal the connection. What can reveal the connection, so to speak? Well, we 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 see that whenever there's light, we end and we go close enough, we feel heat. And so we learn that there's a connection. But then Hume says, this doesn't give us a reason to believe the matter of fact. That is the remote matter of fact. What do you mean it doesn't give us a reason? I just said what it gives us the reason, right? Like we learn that there's this connection and the connection uh, uh, between the effect and the cause like underwrites the inference from the effect to the cause. And that's the reason we believe in the remote matter effect because of the inference from the effect to the cause. But Hume says, well, but hold on a second. So learning about a connection from experience, um, like we can only do this if a certain general principle is, is true. And the general principle is, if we've experienced something to happen often enough, we should expect it to always happen. That is, we should expect it to happen in the future. But again, of course, that we should also believe that it happened in the past, even when we weren't there to experience it, and it's happening now, even in places where not, where we're not experiencing it, right? So we should believe that it always happens if we've experienced it to happen often enough. So, right, so then from that general principle, you could then conclude, like, for example, well, if I've seen, if I, if I've experienced heat often enough when getting closer to the thing that causes light, then I should conclude that that always happens. So if I see light here now, then I know that if I approach it, I'll feel heat in the future. But also, you know, uh, um, If I remember that I saw light before, I know that if I had gotten closer, I would have felt heat. <laughs> right? So it's not all about the future. It's but it's all about remote matters of fact. Um, so but that's all gonna be based on this general principle that if something's happened often enough, um it, it will always happen. And Hume says, uh um, um, that general principle, right, which you could call the principle of induction, where does that general principle come from? I guess, I mean, maybe I'm explaining this a little bit wrong. I think that if this really gave us a reason, it would have to be because we knew this general principle. Right? That is, in order to make this into a demonstration, we need another premise. So, right, one premise is, whenever there's been light before, if I got closer, I felt heat. The conclusion is supposed to be, whenever there's light, if someone gets closer, they'll feel heat. So Hume says those two aren't the same as each other, right? Like, as he, as he puts it, there's a gap, there's a step that the mind has to take between them. There's no contradiction in saying, um, whenever I've seen light before I felt heat, but uh, it doesn't always happen. 
will never happen in the future even. No contradiction, right? Uh, we can tell it's not a contradiction because like if we would only seen it once, that wouldn't follow. It has to be enough times, right? So like, uh, so there's a, there's a gap here that has to be filled in. And Hume says, well, so to make this a rational demonstration, we would have... Okay. What was I saying before that happened? Um... Oh, right. So to make it a good inference, well, actually, I don't know when it when when did I break up? You were saying that to make this a good inference, we would have to provide a clear principle for premise two. Yeah, there was have to provide. Yeah, for we need another premise, right? And the the premise is um, that. Again, if something happens often enough, it always happens or something like that. And so the Hume says, but wait, where would we get this principle? Um, so he says, it's not demonstrative. Um, and then he translates that as the opposite doesn't imply a contradiction, right? So again, that's because he thinks the only relation of ideas that we can conclude things from is um, identity and difference, basically, right? So like uh, um, demonstrations are always based on showing that the opposite of the conclusion would be a contradiction. So he says, but the opposite of this principle is not a contradiction. Right to say that something happened really often, but doesn't always ha happen. There's no contradiction in that. Moreover, he says, like no demonstration is like that. Right, a demonstration for like it doesn't. It never matters for a demonstration how many times something happens. Um, but like. Never mind that part. I mean, so it's like, I think it should be clear why he's saying this is not demonstrative. So if it's not demonstrative, that is, it's not based on relations of ideas. The only alternative is that it's uh, about matters of fact, right? That is, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not impossible that this principle would be wrong, but as a matter of fact, it's right. But then that would mean that we have to have learned this principle uh, by an inference from effect to cause. And obviously that won't work, right? Because the inferences from effect to cause are supposed to all be backed up by this principle. So we can't have derived the principle itself by an inference from effect to cause. That is, this principle can't be empirical. Um, and therefore, so the skeptical conclusion is um, that we have no reason for our belief in any remote matters of fact. We, we believe in them, but the belief in them is not the result of reasoning. So that's the skeptical doubt, right? Then there's a skeptical solution. Um, I think, I mean, it's interesting to ask what Hume means by calling it a skeptical doubt and a skeptical solution. Uh, um, Thomas Reed actually makes fun of him and says skeptical doubt means doubting doubt. 
<laughs> and skeptical to solution to these doubts means doubting solution to these doubting doubts. Uh, but presumably Hume means something else, perhaps more technical by skeptical, but uh, I'm not going to try to figure that out. Um, but I'll just say what the skeptical solution is. So... Um, All right, so this is on page 30. Um, all belief of matter of fact or real existence but he should say, right, remote matter of fact, because again, he hasn't raised doubts about pre the present evidence of the senses or memory. All belief of matter of fact or real existence is derived merely from some object present to the memory or senses and a customary conjunction between that and some other object. Um, so that's a skeptical solution. I mean, this provides more evidence for exactly what he means by skeptical here, but it's a skeptical solution. So like a non-skeptical solution would be to explain how, after all, we can know this principle. Or maybe uh, like, maybe we would get off the boat at one of these other steps, right? Like we, could sh we would show how we can know about matters of fact other than by an inference from effect to cause. Um, or yeah, we would show that we can learn about such connections without experience, right? I mean, that that's, that's where Locke gets off, right? Because again, Locke says, we don't need experience to know that solidity uh goes together with uh impulse um but uh so that would be a non-skeptical solution a non-skeptical solution would somehow fix this up and provide the reason that we have for beliefs in matters of fact but uh the skeptical solution doesn't provide a reason but provides like another explanation for why we believe it We don't believe it because of a reason, but we believe it because of a customary conjunction. So, um, why does a customary conjunction make us believe this? Um, and so, like, by the way, it's it's because it's a skeptical solution, that is because we're not trying to provide a reason, that we're not going to end up on a circular... Um, reasoning circularly in this case as, with this answer as well, right? Because like, how do we know that customary conjunction makes us do this? Well, by experience, right? Um, I mean, that is, it's, there's an inference from effect to cause involved here. Um, but uh, so if we were if we're trying to supply this as a reason for the belief, that would again be circular. But we're not. We're just trying to say, um, we're just trying to give something else we should believe. <laughs> that if we believe that, we'll believe that we believe this. 
<laughs> and so uh, it's okay if we have no more reason to believe one than the other, so to speak. I, I don't know how to put it better than that. Um, but again, it's 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 that Hume is really serious when he says that we do believe these things. And he includes himself. So we do believe that the future will be like the past. So in particular, we believe that the mind will work the same way in the future that it has in the past. Um, and that can't give us a reason for believing in remote matters of fact, but it can help us uh, um, simplify reduced to a more general principle, the fact that we believe that in remote matters of fact. Um, that is, reduce it to a more general principle that we also believe. <laughs> um, so uh, there's still something tricky about this, and I'm not explaining as well as I could, but um, anyway, that's as much I want to say about that for the moment, because so so the question is, like, so why this customary conjunction, right? So the answer is going to be, um, when we say we learn about such connections from experience, we don't mean that we prove that such connections exist from experience. We mean that we come to believe that such, such connections exist because of customary conjunctions. And the question is, where? why does customary conjunction one conjunction isn't enough. Why does a lot of conjunction <laughs> um, cause us to believe that there's a connection? Um, so in order to answer that, Hume goes into this detailed discussion of what belief actually is. That's part two of section five. What is belief? I wrote down in my notes that every year I, I end up spending the remainder of the lecture talking about what Hume thinks belief is which is really interesting, but then I don't get to talk about the idea of power that he discusses in section seven, which is really unfortunate. So I hope I can somehow avoid that this year, although um, unfortunately the future probably will be like the past, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the question is, what is belief? And um, and Hume considers different possibilities for what belief could be. So one possibility is that so. Uh, so the question is, so the way he puts the question is, what's the difference between merely imagining something and believing that it really exists? Or really, or merely imagining some state of affairs and believing that it's the real state of affairs? Right? I mean, it, he, I think he, he, he takes those to be two different ways of saying the same thing. We have a complicated idea. And the question is, um, uh, are we taking that to be the idea of something that actually is there or not? In other words, what's the difference, as he also puts it, between beliefs and known fictions, right? By known fictions means I know it's a fiction, right? Because they, I mean, there's no difference between beliefs and, and false beliefs. False beliefs are a kind of belief, <laughs> right? So like if I, you know, um, believe there's an elephant outside um, and there isn't really an elephant outside, that's still a belief, right? But if I, if I 
imagine an elephant outside now and that, so i know there isn't really that's a known fiction or at least i don't know there is really right like i don't have to know it's false i just but the point is i'm not taking it to be true i'm just imagining it entertaining it whatever right so that's the question what's the difference between beliefs and known fictions so um so they so the belief that there's an elephant out there and the known fiction that there's an elephant out there have something in common, namely the idea of an elephant, <laughs> right? So like, here's the idea of an elephant. Um, and I say they have something in common, but I think Hume, takes it as obvious that the the known fiction so to speak consists in only having the idea right so remember this is where it's important to remember how hume is using idea differently than uh Locke and Barclay did right so like if i'm seeing the elephant that's not an idea according to hume that's an impression so suppose I just have an idea of an elephant. So that means I have like a faded copy of, uh, well, in the simplest case, let's say I've seen an elephant before. I have a faded copy of that elephant impression. But maybe if it's an idea of a unicorn, right? I've never seen a unicorn before, but again, like it's made out of parts that are faded copies of actual impressions that I've had like white and shaped like a horse and having a horn and whatever, right? So, um, um, and so Hume is saying, like, is thinking, well, if you just have the idea, um, I don't know, maybe you could put it this, like, the idea is what's common to every way that I could relate to there being an elephant outside. Thinking there's an elephant outside, wanting to there be an elephant outside, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So like the idea by itself is just means entertaining the picture of an elephant outside, but let's leave the, uh, leave the outside out. Right? I mean, there's an idea of an elephant and also various other ideas, but let's just focus on the elephant. The question is, is, is this an elephant I believe in or is it an elephant that I'm knowingly inventing? So, so therefore, Hume, the, the, the question comes down to what do I what do I add to the mere idea of an elephant to make it a belief that there's an elephant? Right, so having the idea of the elephant is something like having a picture. I mean, it doesn't have to be vision, right? Like every once in a while, you should remind yourself of that, even though the philosophers themselves often don't remember it. That there's other senses too, right? <laughs> so it's something like a picture or some kind of sense image of an elephant. Um, um, and the question is like, what does it take to make that picture into a belief in an elephant? So one possibility Hume considers is that what I have to add is another idea. And I mean, this other idea would basically be the idea of existence. Right, so uh, like the idea that I have that that I have to add to any of my ideas to make them into a belief that the object exists would be the idea of existence. So now it's not just the idea of an elephant, but it's the idea of an existing elephant, because I've added the idea of existence. So remember, Locke thinks there is an idea like this. Although uh, it's kind of complicated how it works, and I'm not going to 
try to go again into exactly like how I understand this idea of existence to work in Locke. But um, 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 whereas, you know, Barclay thinks there is no idea like that. How Barclay understands the difference between belief and known fiction. Yeah, I think it's going to, for Barclay, it's going to have to do with what rules I've set up for exchanging ideas for each other. It's going to be perhaps kind of different from Hume's answer. But in any case, so Hume also says there is no idea like this, but he has a different kind of proof, I think, than Barclay does for why there's no idea like this. And it's a little bit weird proof. Right? But what he says is, it's a little bit weird, although it's, it's not by coincidence very similar to something that Kant says. Um, so what Hume says, the idea that mind has authority over all its ideas. Remember, I promised last time that there was going to be something like the thought that ideas depend on the will and impressions don't. So, so here it comes, right? Hume says, the mind has authority over all its ideas. What does that mean exactly? I mean, uh, it doesn't mean I can have any idea I want whenever I want. But it does mean apparently that I can, if I have two ideas, um, I'm I'm always free to put them together to form a complex idea. How do we know that from experience? I guess, <laughs> but or maybe it's somehow a corollary of the fact that ideas are inert. Well, yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, however it is, we know that, right? So like, you know, if we have the idea of the body of a horse and the idea of a horn growing out of an animal's body, right? Not just any old horn, but a horn that's actually growing out of an animal's body. Um, we can put these two ideas together. And now we have the idea of a unicorn. So, I mean, if I like, if I didn't have the idea of a body of a horse, if I, uh, or, I mean, I mean, so here it's a little tricky what it means to have the idea just as it was in Locke. Like, does that mean, well, I haven't been paying attention to the chat here. Oh, this was Josephine about Barclay. So, right, Josephine said known fiction would be an idea from a human spirit. A true belief is an idea from God, but that's that that that's not right because an an idea from God is an actual sensation, right? So, in other words, if God causes the idea of elephant in my mind, that means I'm I'm sensing the elephant now. But I can believe in that that the elephant is there even when I'm not sensing the elephant. So that's just my idea. That's not directly coming from God. And the question is, what makes that idea a belief? Uh, yeah. So anyway, sorry, back to Hume. Um, so like if I don't have the body of the idea of a body of a horse, or if like I can't bring it to my mind now for whatever reason, then of, then, of course, I wouldn't be able to do this, right? I wouldn't be able to form the idea of a unicorn. But um, not that a unicorn is just a horse with a horn growing out of it. But anyway, close enough. Right. So, uh, um, uh, but if I do have both these ideas, 
then I'm always free to put them together. And now Hume says, so suppose the difference between belief in a unicorn and, and the known fiction of a unicorn were just that belief in the unicorn includes one more idea, the idea of existence. So presumably the idea of existence is an idea that I have, right? Because like, as Locke says, it comes in with every single idea or, or impression, I guess you would say, right? So it's an idea that I definitely have, right? I'm like constantly being reminded of it, so to speak. So, um, uh, so therefore, so this is the idea of existence. I'm free to add it to these other two ideas. So just as when before all I had was the idea of a horse and the idea of a horn, I'm free to put them together. And now I have the idea of a unicorn. If before all I had was the idea of a unicorn and the idea of existence, I'm free to put them together and form the idea of an existing unicorn. And we're saying that that is the belief in the unicorn, right? The difference between uh, entertaining a unicorn as a known fiction and believing that there's a unicorn is only that one of them, can, that, that the belief contains this additional idea, the idea of existence. So if I can put this idea of existence together with these other two ideas, then uh, I can make myself believe that there's a unicorn. Um, and Hume says, um, but we can't do that, right? We can't choose what to believe. This is actually, um, Maimonides was the a great, the, the greatest medieval Jewish philosopher, probably you leave out the medieval too, <laughs> the greatest Jewish philosopher, um, but also was very important in the Jewish legal tradition and wrote this uh, code of law. Um, and it begins with like the first commandment that he discusses is the command to uh, to know that there is a God. Um, and uh, there was this other guy called the Rived, the right the Rabbat of Poskier, whatever. Anyway, um, who wrote a commentary on Maimonides. Uh, code of laws and basically like his commentary consists on attacking him <laughs> and he attacks that very first sentence basically and he says um or wait is that is... i may be mixing him up with someone else who attacks the right maimonides there Anyway, so like, but the attack on that from some people was there can't be a command to know or believe something because it's you're not you can't choose what to know or believe. <laughs> so this shouldn't be counted as a commandment, right? So yeah, anyway, that's uh, like what my mind is would say about that. I, I'm not sure it's a good. I mean, or what Kant would say about that. I think they might say the same thing, actually. But in any case, right, so Hume, uh, but in, in like, if so, maybe believing in God is a really special kind of belief. <laughs> um, because what Hume is saying seems to be true in general, right? Like, um, I may want to believe that there's a unicorn outside, but I don't. I can't just choose to. I could try to convince myself, but that's, you know, that's that's a whole different rate. Right? That's not just a matter of freely adding one other idea to my existing ideas. Um, all right. 
the future is coming to resemble the past. I'm spending more time on this than I should. So that's the proof that belief doesn't consist in the addition of an idea. Right, so again, if we just go back to the idea of the elephant case. Oh, and I guess, so again, as usual, you can ask, so how do we know? Um, well, how do we know that we can't choose to believe things? And how do we know that we can always freely add any idea to any other? Maybe this is an exception, right? I mean, the idea of existence is a pretty weird idea. Maybe it has special properties and this is the one we can't just choose to add. So, um, and it's that question is especially pressing because um, later on in section seven, He says, um, the command of the mind over itself is limited, as well as the command over the body. And these limits are not known by reason or any acquaintance with the nature of cause and effect, but only by experience and observation, right? So it sounds like if we, uh, if it's true that we can't choose what to believe and that we can always freely combine any two of ideas, ideas, we must know that from experience, right? That's like, perhaps there's a limit to our power in that respect. But I think what Hume is thinking this may be related to why Kant or Maimonides would think belief in God is, is an unusual case. But I think what Hume is thinking is that uh, um, something we could choose uh, couldn't count as belief. We, the, like, I mean, I'm in risky ground here because I don't, there isn't anything really in the text I can point to where he's saying this, but I think this is what makes, this is how you could be so sure. Like, how can you be so sure that we can't just choose what to believe? And I think the reason is, I mean, okay, so there's something I can point to in the text, right? Like whenever he talks about the difference between fiction, known fiction and belief, he always emphasizes that belief has a has a role in guiding our actions that known fiction doesn't. Right? Like if I believe that there's an elephant outside, um, I'm going to act really differently than if I'm just imagining that there's an elephant outside. I don't know what I would do if I thought there was an elephant outside, probably call animal control or <laughs> I'm not sure. But in any case, um, uh, uh, if I just imagine there's an elephant outside, I probably won't do anything about it. It might have some influence on my actions, but it's not gonna have the kind of steady um, uh, and, it's not going to have the kind of steady and it's not going to have the kind of rationally necessary action influence on my actions. But I think I said, believe there's an elephant outside and I don't do anything different. Then I'm being irrational. Um, so, uh, so that is like, the thing we're trying to understand is a thing that we're able to appeal to in deciding what to do. And if we could freely choose whether to, to believe or not, that would, um, that would fail, right? Because now I'm deciding what to do. And what I'm going to do depends on whether I believe there's an elephant outside. 
but now I'm able to decide whether I believe there's an elephant outside or not. So there's the constraint goes away. Um, so I think that's like the, that's why, I mean, that, that might be like, you might say that, that we don't know this by experience. We know this by relation of ideas, but it has to do with the very definition of belief that we couldn't just choose to believe things. Um, okay. So we've eliminated that. So if it's not by the addition of idea, how is it different? And the answer, I think, roughly speaking, but this is only, but this is only like kind of a first pass at it, is that it's not a, by the addition of idea, it's by the addition of an impression. And now this solves the problem because the mind doesn't have authority over its impressions, right? So again, that's why I said, although Hume didn't really emphasize this, I think he agrees with Barclay that what he's calling ideas don't de uh, de depend on the human will, at least to a certain extent. Our authority over them isn't unlimited, but we have some authority over them. I mean... When we get to section seven, we'll see that we don't really know exactly what that means. <laughs> but um, but at least for now, we're saying, you know, okay, uh, we know the mind has some authority over its ideas, but we know it doesn't have authority over its impressions, right? So like if there's an elephant right here in front of me I, and my eyes are open, and I'm looking at it, I can't choose not to see an elephant. Um, but the impression here is not the impression of an elephant, right? Because again, that wouldn't be belief. That would be, or at least it wouldn't be a leap belief in a remote matter of fact, right? It would be present evidence of the senses. That's not the case we're talking about. So it's not the impression of an elephant. But it's some other, it's some impression. Um, Hume mostly, although I think he sometimes uses the impression, the word impression here, he mostly says sentiment or feeling. But I think sentiment or feeling is a name for uh, an internal impression right like what Locke would call an idea of reflection um when when it's an impression and not merely an idea right so um so examples of sentiments and feelings are passions like anger and so forth um So there's some sentiment or feeling that when it accompanies an idea, that's what makes it a belief. Now, you might ask, Okay, so what sentiment or feeling is belief? Or makes for belief or whatever. Um, and I think Hume's short answer to that is that um, a sentiment or feeling can't be defined. I mean, I guess it could be if it's complex, but then it has to consist of simple ones that can't be defined. I, I don't know if it would make a difference. I think it wouldn't make a difference if we allowed that the sentiment might be complex and then did, but uh, Hume seems to assume that it's simple anyway. Um, so I can't give a definition of it. So when you ask what, 
passion or belief is it? I'm sorry, what passion or sentiment is it? Hume says um, the proper name of it is belief. <laughs> and just, um, and everyone knows from reflection what the sentiment or feeling is because everyone believes things, right? So, um, so unlike the taste of a pineapple, where because I can't define it, um, I might know what it is, but you might not. And I would have no way of getting you, of explaining to you what it is, because I, the only way would be to get you to taste a pineapple. Um, in the case of this sentiment or feeling, everyone has it constantly. And we have a word for it, and the word for it is belief. <laughs> So that's the short answer. The short answer, what sentiment or feeling is it? It's the one we call belief. But Hume says, um, um, although we can't define um, a passion or belief, we can give a description of it. Um, right, so here we go. Um, right, were we to attempt a definition of these sentiment, we, this sentiment, we should perhaps find it a very difficult, if not an impossible task, in the same manner as if we should endeavor to define the feeling of cold or the passion of anger, blah, 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 blah. It may not, however be improper to attempt a description of this sentiment in hopes we may by that means arrive at some analogies which may afford a more perfect explication of it. So description, this is actually a technical term here, right? Um, in, you know, traditional like Aristotelian logic, the difference between a definition and a description is that the a definition um, tells you what the essence of something is. A description um, just gives you some marks you can use to recognize it by. So all kinds of things that can't be defined, such as, for example, the highest genera or categories uh, can be described, um, right? So I can't define substance because that would mean giving its genus and species, but it's the highest genus. But I can describe it by saying, for example, that it's not in a subject or set of a subject or whatever, stuff like that. Okay, I mean, that's a, that's the traditional background of this term. Um, I, I don't know if Hume is focused on all those technical details, but, he's, but he is using it to mean a way of telling you what something is that doesn't amount to a definition, right? And in this case, the, the way is going to give some, is going to be to give some analogies between it and some other things. Um, and the specific analogy he draws, um, is between, well, he offers a bunch of analogies actually, I guess, but the, um, but for example, one of them is the analogy to a certain aspect of color perception. Um, so, uh, remember I was saying before, like, if you draw the color solid, I don't know if people know about this or not, but, right, this kind of like, you can arrange all the colors that we can see in a kind of three-dimensional solid. Well, I guess that three in a solid, right? That is in a three-dimensional arrangement. And like, you know, hue varies as you go around this way. 
So it goes from red to orange to yellow to green to blue to purple and then back to red. Um, that's why it's a circle, right? I mean, that's not true of wavelengths of light or whatever, but it is true of the colors that we see. Um, and then uh, I guess usually people, the way people draw that is that uh, this direction goes from dark to light. I'm not sure what Hume thinks about this direction, right? But so like black is here and white is here. And then this direction, the radial direction here is what we call saturation. So like along this line, you get all shades of gray. And then as you go out from the line in different directions, it gets more and more colorful. So you're not changing from like, I mean, yeah, it's it's changing from dull blue to bright blue, as opposed to like changing from blue to purple or changing from lighter to darker blue, but they could be just, just be both as bright. Well, they couldn't just be both as bright, right? That's why this is a solid, right? It has this curve, like, the, the darker it is, the less bright it can it can be. <laughs> but never mind that. So that so anyway, there's like so when you go in this direction, differences of hue, Hume says that each one of those, I think that's what he calls shades, is uh is a different idea. Um, right, and that's why that example of the missing shade of blue was an example where it seemed like the mind could produce an idea when it didn't have a previous impression. And like I said, I'm not sure what he thinks about this direction, <laughs> but this direction, I think Hume thinks is not like that. You're not getting to different ideas as you go along this line. I don't know what he thinks about the gray shades on the axis. A good question. <laughs> but remember, he doesn't think there's any such thing as continuity. So like all these lines will stop before they get to the axis. Maybe that's that's sufficient for him to get out of that problem. Anyway, so as you go along this line from duller to brighter, um, Hume says it's the same idea, but you're changing its degree. So, I mean, that's the fact that Hume allows the same idea to occur in different degrees is a little bit of like a loophole in the thing about there being no necessary connection between distinct ideas. That it's like, um, that every sensible quality or at least every color is a matter of degree, but I think he thinks this holds for all ideas that they have these they have these differences of degree that um, that's something that in Kant's system is going to turn up as a metaphysical principle, a synthetic a priori judgment. Okay, Enoch says Waxman uses the term verisimilitude. That would be an okay term to use, but I don't think I'm going to use it. <laughs> but maybe I will. But so, but I'm still talking about this analogy here, right? So the analogy here is that, um, I mean, how do we understand this analogy? Um, it's not true that I can't decide how intense, I don't think Hume thinks it's true. 
that I can't decide how saturated a color that I want to imagine. I mean, I may not have complete authority over it, but I can imagine dull blue and I can imagine bright blue. Um, so, uh, so the analogy is not going to be perfect. Because whatever the the degree the the way that the idea of elephant has to vary in degree between when it changes from known fiction to belief has to be something that I I have no authority over. I can't just make it increase in intensity. But I think like the analogy is supposed to be. Um, what I think you're supposed to focus on is the fact that this doesn't involve the addition of another idea. It's just the same idea. Um, and yet somehow its force or vivacity changes. Right, and uh, he explains this a little bit better in the par the treatment of this theory in the treatise. So I'm just going to read the quote here. This is from Book One, chapter. It's not part of the treatise we're going to read. Book One, Chapter Three, Paragraph Seven. Um, when you would any way vary the idea of a particular object, you can only increase or diminish its force and vivacity. If you make any other change on it, it represents a different object or impression. The case is the same as in colors. A particular shade of any color may acquire a new degree of liveliness or brightness without any other variation. But when you produce other variation, it is no longer the same shade or color. So the, the difference here, and that's why I said that this is kind of a first pass, because the impression here is not going to be a separate impression of something else. Um, it's somehow the impression is a way that the idea varies from less intense to more intense. So I think the way to understand this is And this is where that term verisimilitude that Enoch suggested could come in. What, what, what varies in degree is the impression likeness of an idea. But I would rather say that than verisimilitude, <laughs> right? I mean, because for one thing, again, uh, well, no, I guess that's not true. The sensation can't be wrong in a sense. So it is, a belief is, is similar to a true, to something that's true, but still, I think that's a confusing way to think about it. It's just that this scale, right? Like here's known fiction and here's an impression. So this is actually seeing the elephant. This is merely imagining the elephant. And the idea is that, or the theory is that belief consists in getting more like this. So this is like zero belief. I'm merely entertaining it. This is like, um, full belief, 
it's exempt at least from the type of skeptical doubts that we're raising now, right? So I really believe it. And in between, well, you can believe it more strongly or less strongly. And that has to do with how much of the force of an impression it has. And so when we say it's a sentiment or feeling, it's like, I think maybe it'd be better to think of it as the kind of the sentiment or feeling aspect of an idea. <laughs> um, like in this known fiction case, it's not at all like a sentiment or feeling. But as you get closer and closer to an impression, it has more and more of a feeling or sentimentness to it. Okay, and now, oh my, the same thing has happened again. The future is like the past. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I won't really get to talk about the interesting things that happen in section seven. They are really interesting. The next time I'm going to have to talk, you know, like I'm going to have to start talking about stuff in the treatise. What should I say in the last four minutes? So I guess I just want to finish this, how this is supposed to explain how constant conjunction works. Um, constant conjunction causes an association, that's number one. So like if I've often seen light and felt heat together and I have the idea of light, then the idea of heat is likely to come in as well. Um, that, that is, that's part of that regular conjunction, a regular uh, sequence of ideas, the way they, they always occur in our mind, even in a dream, according to Hume, right? And like, sure enough, even in dream, if you uh, see light, you're likely to feel heat, I guess. It's always unclear exactly what sensations you really have in a dream. But anyway, I think that's the way Hume thinks about it. So, uh, um, so that's number one, but that still doesn't, that still doesn't explain belief, right? Because like, uh, I can have the, merely have the idea of an elephant and then I'll have the idea of the smell of an elephant or whatever. And, uh, um, that doesn't make me believe in the smell of an elephant, Right, it just makes just makes me imagine it. But Hume says, you know, that's why it's always quote unquote inference from effect to cause, where the effect is some present, something present now to the senses. What that means is that I have two ideas that in general are associated with each other. And now, right, so like idea of light and idea of fire are like associated with each other. So whenever I get one, I'll get the other. But now instead of the idea of light, this, I get an impression. So I get the idea of light, but with full force, full vivacity. And then two things happen. Number one, the associated idea comes back. So I guess I should have said heat here, not fire. All right. So the associated idea heat comes back. So I sense the light and I think of the, the heat. But the second thing that happens, Hume says, is that some of the force of the impression gets transferred to the idea. 
the idea becomes more lively, more likely to affect my actions, whatever, because it was brought in in association with an actual impression. And why does that happen? Well, Hume says maybe this is just an ultimate fact about the mind, but he says it's similar to a lot of other things that happen. Like, for example, if you see a picture of your friend, you'll have a, that will cause you to have a stronger or more vivid uh, imagining of your friend than you would without the picture. All right. Um, that is all I have time for. So I will see you next week. And uh, as 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 I guess is normal this quarter, I have no idea whether it'll be in person or via Zoom or what will be going on, but I will try to let you know in advance um, as soon as I know. Um, oh, and also if um, um, if you didn't see the email, um, so as I mean, I only heard a kind of secondhand rumor about this before, but now, like I found out yesterday, that Terry, our TA, she was in a car accident last week, and a uh, pretty serious car accident. She's still in the hospital. Oh, sorry, that's that's for the other course. What am I talking about? That's for 106. Our TAs are Chelsea and Enoch. Never mind. All right. Wait, uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, yeah. I actually, I am in the other course. I'm not entirely yes. sure what happened with Terry. Would you mind? Uh, okay, so for people who are in other course or people who just know Terry and would, would like to know, um, she was in a pretty serious car accident last week. Uh, it, it took a while for the news to, to get through to me, but um, she's still in the hospital. Um, she's doing better than she was, but she's probably not coming back to, to teach this quarter. And so for 106, we're probably getting a new TA. But the details of that are not settled yet. But that does that is why. Um, so if you're in 106, you should have gotten the email where I said this. I think I said it. Yes, you did. Okay. Did I accidentally say it in the email to this course too? Maybe I did. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't know. Anyway. No, I you didn't. I Oh, I, I didn't, didn't get okay. an email like that. I, I don't know which is my left and which is my right hand. All right. I'm <laughs> just, but okay. So anyway, um, uh, yeah. So that's why the grades in 106 are delayed um, because she was planning to finish that this weekend, but obviously she didn't. So um, I'll have to figure out what to, I may, I may extend the deadline for the second midterm should have talked about that obviously not now but in the other class why am i talking about it now <laughs> this is stupid all right um anyway uh uh okay so uh, this class thank heavens <laughs> as of now uh, me and the tas are are still in good health so that shouldn't be a problem next week but uh who knows what will happen all right well, one way or the other i hope i'll see you then bye